Okay. Um, let's see here. So, uh, Marius, uh, Marius and Mati are actually both out today. Um, so, um, it's just, it's just me. Um, so to go over the, the work since the last update, um, we, um, we, um, updated mainnet to guy V13 or, you know, the validator set updated mainnet to guy V13, um, on October 12th. Um, it went pretty quickly. Um, one thing that was added in that update was um, a governance proposal to add consumer reward denoms. So um, when tokens are coming in from consumer chains, they um, they have to be added by um, they have to be added by uh, by by a by a governance proposal. Um, so uh, that's because there's a lot there's a lot of tokens coming from Stride and, and they're actually kind of increasing the gas price a little bit to uh to claim rewards um so we just wanted to make it a little bit more explicit um to to have those added um and we also removed the liquidity module completely um another thing we've been doing during this time is we finished the code and the final security review on cryptographic equivocation um so that's basically the uh the code that is able to look at um look at double signs that happen on consumer chains uh, and slash validators for them on the hub. Um, and there are some details about that. We're going to have to ramp up a comms effort with validators, um, but there are some details around that, which is that I've, I've, we have a thread on the forum about this too, but um, was somebody saying something? Sorry. Anyway, um, the, uh, these, um, the double signing evidence uh, with a method that we use, it doesn't expire. Um, so that means there, there are some edge cases, like if there was a test net, which uh, ran like, I don't know, a long time ago or something and had the same chain ID as a consumer chain main net, um, evidence from like evidence could be generated that sort of says uh, there was a double signing because this, this block on the test net was signed and this block on the main net was signed. Um, and that could be, that could lead to a validator being slashed, even though they had run a test net a while ago and then main net now, right? So um, the thing is though, that is completely avoidable and it's completely safe um, as long as, um, it's completely safe as long as um, the, uh, as, as long as validators use new keys. So with consumer chains, we have the key assignment thing. So basically validators can assign, um, assign their keys um, and on, on consumer chains, they can rotate keys frequently. And so as long as whenever a new consumer chain starts, you use a new key with it and you don't use some private key that you used a long time ago on something else, um, there's absolutely no risk of this. So we're just going to make sure before we get this out into in, in V14, we're going to make sure that everyone knows that. Um, but uh, yeah, that once we have that out, that should be able to avoid situations like the uh, Prop Eight One Eight situation. Um, and uh, yeah, we're also working on uh, upgrading ICS to uh, the V fifty version, the zero fifty version of the Cosmos SDK. Um, and um, that's um, that's that's moving along. I think and Macho would be able to give more detail on that, but he's not he's not in today. Um, and then also we've been doing uh, uh, we've been doing design work on um, basically what we call read only protocols, so removing VSC matured packets. Um, and I guess probably don't have enough time to get into what that all involves, but we'll do a, a whole write up on it. What it will allow us to do, though, removing the VSC matured packets, it removes the it would remove the unbonding pausing, um, and it makes the security model a little bit more complicated, but it uh, will allow the protocol to be simplified a lot. Um, which will let us iterate faster too. So that's going to be great. Um, and then on on my end, I've been working on sort of specking out and doing initial plans on partial set security um, and atomic IBC, uh, atomic IBC um, mega block shim. Those are up on the forum. We've also introduced a new process that we want to use um, to sort of uh, increase accountability or um, kind of get community input before we spend time uh, researching things. And um, well, major you know major protocol changes. Um, I call the chips process, and so 
Uh, it's also up on the forum, um, but it involves, you know, having discussion phase first and then it's specification phase, prototype phase, signing proposal. Um, so, uh, so yeah, right now, partial set security, that's like, that's kind of like, it's, it's, um, it's kind of a, a tweak of, of opt-in security. Um, opt-in, you know, opt-in security is like where not every validator needs to run every consumer chain. Um, that would reduce validator costs a lot. So it's something a lot of people want. Um, and partial set security, we made some tweaks uh, on, this is an idea actually from um, Dave Rodriguez, who is, for, works for BlockWorks, he's Effort Capital on Twitter. Um, and what we do is allow validators to um is allow validators to basically um delegate to other validators so if they don't want to run a consumer chain they delegate to another validator who is running it and um so uh that that should let uh the concerns we got around opt-in where that it's not the entire like stake of the hub securing consumer chains which which has bad effects for various reasons but by doing this we allow the entire stake to secure consumer chains even though not every single validator is 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 running them so um we'll be writing more about that in the future too um also and then i guess i'll go to, to haifa for, for udit i guess we um i yeah. guess you guys didn't fill anything in but i can i can take notes as you talk yeah sorry i didn't have access to the document i just requested access but happy to talk through stuff so yeah in terms of main activities that we're working on currently um, first is testnet events. So in the last couple of weeks, we offboarded the composable uh, rehearsal chain. We are planning to do another rehearsal uh, with them while they are in voting period. So they're considering going in voting relatively soon. When they're doing that, we're going to do another rehearsal with them. Um, the Noble rehearsal has now been pushed back to November 29th. Um, and uh, so we'll be planning a rehearsal with them as well. Uh, of course, with the V14 upgrade that's going to ha happen relative, relatively soon, we'll need to be doing a public testnet around that. Um, so we're going to be starting to plan that. Part of this effort is also going to be to work with validators to communicate this point that Jahan was talking about, which is that validators should exclusively be using assigned keys on their consumer chains. Um, so this is part of the uh, cryptographic equivocation Slashing, slashing changes coming up. Um, next point is Gaia maintenance and testing. Um, so Dante has been working pretty hard integrating all the cryptographic equivocation tests into our CI for V14. Um, I think that's mostly all done. Uh, we have also been working on Microscope, which is our reporting tool for all the tests that we're doing. Our goal is to have basically a, a, a link in the software upgrade proposal for V14 with um, a the, the, the testnet report that we generate automatically. And that's gonna include basically all the, the list of tests that we've run, all the work that we've done around um, uh, in our, both in our CI and in our public testnets for, uh, for, for all the battery of tests that we run for, for the release. And this is, a norm we kind of want to set so that validators know, um, you know, the, the amount of the testing and uh, that's gone behind every every release. Um, the next point is uh, stress testing. So we've been supporting uh, teams who are doing stress testing on the the hub testnet. This has been taking on some of our time. Um, Related to this is War Game Thursdays. Um, we've been working with AA DAO to see if we can incentivize um, um, test net, a broader participation on the testnet. And the purpose of this is this is going to allow us to do better stress testing on the testnet since we can have a similar network size and stake distribution as the mainnet. So currently we have about 60 full nodes um, operating on the on, on the testnet. We want to get this up to 200. Um, this is going to get to the same type of level as uh, as a mainnet, and hopefully these um, AA DAO incentives can help 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 bring us to the same to the same level. Um, um, you mind if I comment real quick? Sure. On that end? Okay. Sorry, and sorry for like interrupting your flow or whatever. Uh, for the purpose of block gossip simulation that does not actually get us there. So like block gossip 
is something that should get fixed. Um, not precisely sure yet how, but here, here's what Zucky told me about it. Block mm -hmm. Gossip currently sends random block parts to random peers in random order. Um, and it does this like all at once. So if you've ever watched like the bandwidth graph, your node uh, going through blocks, well, um, that spike, when a, when a block comes, that's actually the proposal arriving from the proposer. And, uh, well, you know, the, the bit that I was saying about stuff being kind of extra spicy on main nets is, is related to that because the spicy level scales with number of nodes. Um, and so 200 is good. It's like way better than what we have. And I'm super enthusiastic about Wargame Thursdays. Um, but at least for that component and maybe for the mempool, which is like weirder and more lossy, um, I, I'm not sure that we should treat 200 as the same, but also I want to say like, this is a really, really good effort. And we should do it. I, I was wondering about that. I, I think there's, in terms of like coverage and in, in, a, in a testing sense, there's lots of different ways to get coverage that's similar to production. Um, and, and one way for sure, if you have a bunch of different people, like you incentivize them um, to join a test net, what's good about that is you get the coverage of having lots of weird configs that people might have and strange locations of nodes and things like that. And so that really helps. Probably the best is if you, if you have thousands of people running nodes, because then you get a large number of weird nodes. Um, and so it's very accurate coverage to me. Now, I'm wondering also though, could it be possible maybe to have, to increase coverage through incentivizing real people to run nodes to get the weird setups, but then also maybe have um, have scripts to temporarily spin up a bunch of nodes um, using Ansible for, 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 you know, during tests to kind of, uh, if, if you want to bump up the number of nodes. Um, yeah, so this, think that this would is be something where, useful. yeah, so this is exactly what we want to do for Wargame Thursdays is we're going to be, the, the problem is that we don't want to, we, we don't want to have all these full nodes running all the time just because it gets really costly. And so we want to contain all this trust testing effort to like a single day. So this is kind of just building on the, the test net Wednesdays idea where we contain activities on certain days so that we can just make it more predictable and scalable and know exactly what days we have to do what. And so we're game Thursdays, we're going to, Yes, we're going to incentivize other people to be running full nodes, but also we're going to be running both our own attack scripts and also be running extra full nodes. Um, also, we'll encourage other partner teams, such as Notional, to run attacks. I know you all have already been doing this kind of work, but it's going to be super helpful for us to continue doing this on on Thursdays moving forward. And it's, I guess it's not necessarily going to be, it's not quite as good as if you had a bunch of random real people running a bunch of nodes, but it's also like, I mean, I guess you you don't want to have all those full nodes all be on one computer or something. Uh, Cause that wouldn't, they do need to have some network separation. So I was, yeah. What, have you thought about that? Like, are they going to be? Yeah. So we were, we were, when we were working with Neutron, uh, when they were launching their consumer chain, one of the things that we were helping them was, was trying to get a sense of um, what is the lowest Heimach commit that they that they can work with reasonably. And so part of that was also like trying to distribute the 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 the, the, the nodes that we have in the testnet across um, across the world. Um, and um, so we spun up we spun up nodes in a bunch of different locations around uh, around the world to to do that and i think we'll be use, doing a similar thing with testnet wargame thursdays as well where we can spin up nodes with different uh with different machine types we already actually kind of have this in our ansibles so different machine types different architectures and different uh different geographies Cool. Uh, okay. um, moving yeah, sorry, forward, moving forward. The last thing is uh, the community spend proposal. So I think everybody already kind of knows this, but 
Um, alongside informal, we are looking to transition to community pool funding for next year. Uh, we, and uh, some of the work that we've been doing, this has been mostly Lexa, has been, you know, talking to the community and gathering feedback um, as we prepare to put this uh, proposal on chain um, potentially as soon as next week. So if anybody here has feedback on the proposal, we'd love to get that, you know, on the forum and um, yeah, happy to talk to everybody about that. Cool. Yeah, we um we got some great feedback from Rama. Um, so um, I'm gonna talk to talk to. I think he encapsulated actually a lot of what a lot of people were thinking. So we're gonna we're gonna talk to him. Um, and we've we've already done like kind of one round of of tweaks and and modifications to it based on that. But uh, yeah. Um. Well, I'll I'll go to the miscellaneous section. Um. And uh, I want to introduce uh, Brian Truax. Um, and he's he's joining our team at Informal. Um, he is the operations manager, uh, so he's going to be pretty generalist. But um, he'll be um, he'll be generally kind of optimizing our processes and our and our communication. Um, and he'll probably be starting to take on some stuff like you know communication with validators on on certain things or consumer chain teams and stuff. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything, Brian, or you know, we'll put you on the spot, but. Yeah. No, it's all good, man. Yeah, no, I'm happy to be here. Um, and uh, really excited to join the Cosmos Hub team. Not, you know, just an informal, but this this crew here contributing to the success of the Cosmos ecosystem. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, as Jan said, I'm the business operations manager for the Cosmos Hub team at Informal. Uh, I'm going to be overseeing operations of the team, um, trying to be the main coordinator of internal and external coordination or communications, um, external stakeholder management, and working with Isabel on go-to-market campaigns. Um, so I, I guess in the, all the other stakeholders involved in go-to-market campaigns. Um, it's going to be slow, like setting into the role. So one thing that I would just ask everybody is just bear with me um, as I, you know, get my feet under the desk properly. Uh, definitely the first, you know, 30 to 60 days in this role is going to be a lot of just observation and orientation. Uh, if I walked in here thinking, you know, we can do this better or that better, you know, I wouldn't be doing a good job of actually seeing how things are working first before making recommendations. I think that's the most prudent way to approach this. Um, so yeah, just looking forward to collaborating with everybody and uh, thanks thanks for the opportunity, Jahan, to say something. So if you got any questions, let me know. Uh, if you've got anything uh, you'd like to chat about, send me a DM on Twitter. Uh, I'm B Truax, my first initial one. Uh, last name uh, on Twitter or uh, hit me up on Slack or Discord. Cool. Um, I think that's it for the uh, uh, scheduled programming here. Um, Adi has a question. Just want to chime oh, in. Oh, yeah. There. Adi, sorry. I guess I didn't see him down there. What's up, Adi? Oh, no, it wasn't the question. I just said hi. <laughs> I was just waving. Oh, up. hey, man. Okay. Um, well, I guess I was, if we, if we don't have anything else to cover, I, it was kind of a free, free discussion. Um, I kind of wonder revisit the, uh, if it's, you know, uh, I wonder to revis revisit the, the, the question about, you know, how to simulate a, you know, a large number of full nodes. Um, I'm, I'm just personally interested in it. It's not really my domain necessarily, but I'm just kind of personally interested in it. Um, and maybe, uh, I, I, like one one thing I'm thinking is like you know obviously you wouldn't want to have them all on one computer um, because they would talk to each other over the local interfaces and it would basically not really have the kind of network stress you know that you're that you're looking for right I'm wondering if they're in one data center if they're all in like Amazon US East is that the same situation or is that enough separation to give more accurate results at that point I think it's basically the same situation actually um, yeah. So, you know, they have really, really good networks. And so like one of the characteristics of a live chain, and by the way, this, this is why I've voiced my concern so heavily on the issue that Amulet published, is that live networks 
Okay, so you, you've got your test nets, right? And test nets have a little bit of this because test nets are an assemblage of actual validators, and usually they're using something like their production systems. Uh, one thing that I noticed, because you know we we went through and kind of war gamed out a number of different test nets uh, pursuant to that Amulet thing, uh, is that. On test nets, you're less likely to find sentry nodes. This also means you're less likely uh, to encounter network problems. Um, one of the reasons like that we don't use sentries in production uh, actually is that when we did, uh, they would cause all sorts of network problems. Um, and so, but but basically. You know, there's still a large contingent of validators, I think, that that feel that sentry nodes are necessary. And I, I don't, it's not really like something that's worth spending a lot of time on, right? Like, I'm not going to go to people and say like, hey, you should not use sentry nodes. Um, it's more like I can just sort of present how we do things, um, which I do think is quite secure. And I also think... Um, it reduces uh, really like a number of problems because we, we did a bunch of testing back in the day with uh, Chandra Station when Osmosis was pretty young and Osmosis still had uh, a lot of network issues. And another conclusion actually, so Notional peered with them uh, using what's called uh, Zero Tier. And Zero Tier is a mesh VPN. Uh, that includes fast path routing. So like the more people who join a single zero tier network, they'll all route to each other. And traffic will take the fastest path in there. Um, and so like we reduced our block misses mutually really significantly. That's actually uh, why it was included in that Placid mitigations document because um, I mean, the effect was, was pretty dramatic. And so I guess validators peering with, another, with, with one another uh, could be another variable that we try and test like one Thursday, hey guys, peer with each other, right? And then pour traffic into the outer ring. Because when, when the validators are peered with each other, even if, it's clusters because I wouldn't recommend like the validators peer with other validators that they don't trust. I, I think that would be really bad, actually. Um, you know, my recommendation would be validators should peer only uh, with validators they trust. You know, I've I've told people that it's like, well, there there are validators who absolutely like I I trust. Notional's reputation with them. They seem really conscientious. There are others, you know, I really wouldn't. This forms a graph, mm -hmm. and that's where it gets kind of interesting because you, you then have an actual trust graph that, that is running the network, and that's based on, you know, people's opinions of each other's teams and, uh, and, and their ability to operate well. I think that that would be like a very healthy thing for networks, but also important to test because when you do that, like you're exposing the validators to each other in a way that historically we've just never done that. Or, I mean, Notional did, Chandra Station did. I think a couple of other teams have tried that in a couple of other like situations where they were missing a lot and they didn't have good latency to the core of the network. And then finally, Jihan, to like jump back to really try and answer your question, I do think that we could do it with cloud. Uh, we could even do it kind of with one cloud provider, but there's this whole question of the fact that like one cloud provider is gonna have really good interconnections uh, with itself. So optimally, we would spin up nodes around the world uh, on, let's say, GCE, 
AWS. Uh, we, we could try like Baidu Cloud or Alibaba Cloud. Um, mm -hmm. We could do a little bit on Hotsir Cloud. We could do a little bit on OVH Cloud and then monitor all of these. Also try to get a sense of like, are there paths that suck? Um, and so like, that that's sort of like the dream state. I haven't really done cloud engineering in, uh, I guess the last time was probably four years ago. So um, what I don't know is like the level of effort to set up a multi-cloud testing scenario with current cloud practices. I, I also wonder uh, what could be done with um, simulation we're not sim not not sim not 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 sim not total simulation, but um, there's a tool in Linux called TC, uh, and I've I've personally built um, like mesh network test beds using it, um, and you can you can basically have arbitrary like packet loss, packet delays, um, kind of random degradation, um, and you could probably set up a bunch of full nodes on one computer. Um, and put them all in their own interfaces, and then put uh, TC um, put TC in front of every one of them to to basically like that's not going to be super accurate, obviously, to real life because there's always going to be more weirdness in real life than you can mm -hmm. like simulate even with random delays. But maybe you could spin up like a thousand of those and connect them to the network with all of their artificially crappy connections um, and get a little bit more coverage that way. That would be interesting. So T TC is, is it's specifically for like adding, making it look kind of like the real world. And I assume you did this at Althea. Uh, yeah, even before Althea at Pseudo Mesh oh, okay. in Oakland, our mesh network. Um, we, uh, we, uh, I think Wood remembers those days. Uh, but basically, um, we, we, yeah, we put, I, I put together a tool uh, and, and it, um, TC is actually used not only for making that connections crappy, it's actually mostly intended for kind of, um, for, for kind of uh, actually doing useful things. Um, but it has, it has different, uh, Q, they're called Q-Discs, which are kind of these plugins for it. Uh, and one of them is one that just makes, makes things crappy. So um, that, that could be interesting as, as a way just to add, you know, add load, just kind of add the load of crappy nodes. Like you can have, you could have an arbitrary number of arbitrarily crappy nodes come online at once, just really screw things up. Yeah, I, I guess the yeah, question is like, what good. exactly you're trying to test here? Like, are you trying to test, like, what are the dynamics of the current network? Or are you trying to figure out, you know, given an arbitrary network with yeah, like a stress test almost delays? More. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so like yeah. Um, the dynamics of the current network, I can tell you a little bit about it. The dynamics of the current network are, okay, it, it's 2,500 nodes. The majority of these are actually serving RPCs. Uh, I mean, yeah. at, at Notional, we're looking at like a 51, 51 ratio, right? So um, we have, We've got a validator node uh, and everything else is RPCs. And I, I do, I, it's like 50. Uh, and I think that, that others are in the same position. Uh, probably anybody like Mint Scan, for example, I think that their setup requires lots of nodes. And um, so, you know, you would want like, where do I put this? Uh, well, actually, so that we can personally, I think there's a really interesting set of comments from uh, Clemens, who I should make sure has the link to this call. You know, what, one, one of the things he said to me today was like, you know, we look at this peer to peer storms issue, a lot of it is our fault. And I, I want to like make really clear what he meant by our. He was talking about the validators. And, you know, and on a bunch of levels, um, I agree with him. Um, not every level, right? Because there's there's the, the issues with everything that Amulet published. But um, 
the operators, right? The operators are supposed to basically like even know about uh, the limitations of the software and mitigate them. So sort of like a, a, a and again, like, yeah, I've totally like tried to force transparency on this issue. And this is why, um, because the validators are by, by and large really skilled. They're going to leave out all the like, like the white label commercial validators. I, I don't even know what they do exactly. Probably not a lot. Uh, but by and large, the average hub validator is really good at what they do. And um, so we want to make sure that they've got as much information as possible, of course, without creating danger to the network. And this is a delicate balance that I've struggled a lot with lately, right? Uh, and overall, don't really think Amulet should publish, but since they did, you know, then it's like, okay, how do we get everybody all of the information uh, that they need? And um, so by testing like even weirder scenarios and then gathering feedback, um, it, well, okay, uh, really interesting. Um, disagree with you because, okay, so Udit, Udit just posted, main takeaway is that validators should be actively monitoring the mempool and activity managing their nodes min gas price reacting to mempool congestion and uh while i do think that gas pricing especially like on a global cosmos hub network wide level is super important and it's also super important on the consumer chains i don't think that it's a good idea to have for example validators restarting their node uh, in order to like learn about or in order in order to adjust gas, and right now they need to. Um, but I'll, I'll kind of give you some pointers on how how we operate validators at Notional. Just basically, like we don't want to touch them. So you put it in play, uh, and then that's that. You have a single configuration. Um, configurations for, for the more complex networks, they're, they're like, you know, they're even in Git, right? And so it's like, it's exactly this. And that's, um, it just all helps with having the operation like really, really structured. Um, and so, I would be uncomfortable asking validators to like, okay, now you're gonna set a new min gas and you're gonna restart your node, uh, mainly because, especially if they were doing it in response to congestion, this could actually like exacerbate the problem. Um, I have four governance proposals uh, on the forum uh, that, that I think do help. Uh, so 200 KB blocks, unfortunately, was like, that was the worst in testing. It was actually like the, the worst performing option. It, well, it was about equally bad to 21 megabytes, but different in some ways could, where I felt that- Could these parameters, could they be tried uh, tomorrow and uh, War Game Thursdays with, with that? Actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they were already tried though, is the thing. Um, and, uh, you know, relevant information was uh, submitted to uh, the publisher, uh, which is not good, not good. And um, uh, but but we can, absolutely. Uh, Jihan, to give you a little idea of what's been tested, and some of these had really interesting results. So, you know, max TX bytes, well, um, is Dante here? Like he did some really neat stuff. No, uh, that was what was watched. changed last Thursday, right? Was the max TX bytes? Yeah. So I mean, okay, it worked. <laughs> but, however, there was a net split. Uh, so what it would do when it got a TX that was larger than what it would accept, it would then disconnect from the node sending it. 
And like, you know, some of the validators had this setting set and some didn't. And then what I noticed is when I started the TX stream, right? All of, oh, it was only Apple, Cherry and Banana signing. Um, and that, you know, that's a problem, right? Because it actually meant like none of the other validators could even propose. And I had this really interesting question if anybody had an answer to it, I'd love, love to hear that. I was thinking it might be like the difference between mempool and block gossip, but basically since there was a net split, like looking at my logs, like I pretty firmly believe that there was just a straight clean net split between uh, basically there's those three leading nodes, right? And then there's everybody else. Well, uh, my feeling is that, um, like I couldn't figure out how the, the blocks were actually being seen by the other nodes. I, I just figured there was some intermediary doing it. Because P2P is interesting, guys. You, like, do you know about the 800-node the Quicksilver testnet or the 800-node Omniflix testnet? That, that was fascinating. You could, like, if for both of those... Um, the, the teams ended up contacting me after the network was stood up in both cases. And so I took a single node that was at Hetzner with a really, really beefy connection, right? I told all of the validators to connect to that one node. And then 800, 800 validators were producing blocks at a rate of like 10, 15 seconds, which is pretty awesome. Okay, so on these these uh, the params you've suggested, do you think that we could uh, have the entire we could test the entire package of of those param changes um, on the testnet tomorrow, um, and then uh, you know compare them to the to the existing production parameters? Yeah, just like with one caveat. All right, like first of all, I want to get on a call with you beforehand and walk you through the script and its parameters, and then secondly. Uh, tomorrow is a very vague thing. What I mean is that uh, I think it's like morning-ish for you, right? And right now, the time for me is after midnight. It's 12.41. Um, and uh, actually, Anmal, I, I apologize if I'm getting your name wrong, sir, uh, but I totally agree with you, actually. Um, oh, oh my God, you posted Jepson and Anmal Jepson does such cool stuff. Um, there's also Chaos Monkey from Netflix, uh, and and same class of tools. And like, yes, yes, correct. Like strongly also, correct. I just posted uh, just to uh, shameless plug here, but I posted my tool from from years ago, the Network Lab. I use a TC, like I was saying, so you can give it. Uh, a definition of a network in uh, in JSON format, um, and then it will set up network namespaces on the computer with tunnels between them, uh, with TC on each of those tunnels to provide a, a degraded experience. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know if uh, Jepson, obviously if Jepson is, does network stuff, then they're probably much more maintained and, and complete than my tool. But we use that at Althea probably still um, to test very large uh, very large um, networks um, of virtual nodes with thousands with, with degradation. So. This is really cool. I'll have a look as well. I think uh, Jepson is still a little complex to get your head around, especially with Tendermint. They have some work initially, but yeah, if we can build our own tools with all the things that we're talking about, maybe uh, we might be able to we I, I could also bring Justin Kilpatrick, my former co-founder from Althea, in because he um, he actually used that tool to to set up uh, the Althea test, where we were testing like routing protocols between um, between a bunch of nodes. Um, so he might have more experience with kind of using it for large scale testing. Um, he's pretty into performance stuff, so yeah. That 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 could be really cool. Um, anyway, like. Uh... When would we want to begin this tomorrow? I think that that's a real important question because what, what I can do, I can make sure 
Uh, in fact, here, here's a thought. Uh, Jihan, you should send me an SSH key. That way you can have like the whole sta station. We can both look at it as long as you're comfortable working in screen. screen. Um, uh, because, you know, I, I kind of built like a, a testing machine and it now has a 10 gig line. I actually had to move it physically. Um, and uh, it's it's quite well set up for this. It also has all the necessary wallets and stuff. And that way you won't need to spend easily a day, uh, you know, on the setup. Cause, cause really the, the uh, setting up the infrastructure to run this is kind of like tricky. And then the next thing that you have to do is um, work on, oh, the reason for 10 gigs, by the way, is because if you're in the attack role, then you, you actually want, um, you want your node to survive what I call the echo and that's actually really hard because the, the echo is like this second wave that you're not even causing it anymore. The, the echo is when you see the, the attack node, say your attack node has a 1GB line, right? And everybody else generally is on a 1GB line. Well, when you see your download hit 1GBPS, now the network is echoing and you're in the actual storm at that point. You're getting responses on all your stuff from everybody and it hits you. Um, no, I, I think that all your stuff is being sent into your mempool for no reason. Oh. Is, is, is at least what I think. Cause like, okay. It, it, you, the, the actual response, uh, Jihan, the echo stage is maybe like an hour into one of these. Like one of the things that, that you'll learn from this is that, Running it once takes about two hours, and there are distinct stages to it. Um, in in a scenario, in fact, we might even want to try it with twenty one meg blocks. So the the original state that we tried this in, okay, was and in uh, Udit, am I correct to say that that you guys are able to like? slam through gov props more or less instantly yes we can do that yeah, this is cool because i mean what we could do in pretty rapid order right is like we make the the blocks 21 megs we can make the blocks 15 megs we can make them because we know we you know we didn't try like a middle value like 15 which by the way i think is bad but like we should probably try it for example, I, I I had no idea that two megs would be way, way better than one, but it is. And um, yeah, I mean, that was actually confusing. I also had no idea that, that 200 KB would be so terrible. You know, initially I thought just like smaller would be better, but that's not the way it played out. And then... Um, if uh, so we, we could run through a set of block sizes we let's see what else is governance adjustable we have the different slashing settings which i i really do think that if we jail people faster uh there's a lot less risk because as one of these things gets rolling uh we're gonna see block times in excess of 30 seconds um and so that's five time, like, you know, five days to jail a validator that can't sign. And uh, that's like definitely a problem. And uh, then- Jacob, I wonder if we can make a, a 
a test plan so we can systematically do this. One of the things that I'm concerned about is just doing a whole bunch of governance proposals and then seeing the effect afterwards and not being able to isolate the effect of each specific change that we're making. Oh, I um, have good news for you. I have good news. Uh, Clemens yes. will be able to do that. He, we, we have, and, and Notional has about probably like half of what he's got set up. We're like basically trying to figure out how to get those kinds of capabilities. Um, but like definitely gonna, gonna point you to him because it's amazing what he has in terms of monitoring now. Another person who can probably help with this is Joe Bowman because uh, he did something totally different um, but also very interesting, like very, very different from what Clemens was doing. And basically, we will be able to see the differences. The only thing, and they're like, I guess I, I'll just bring this up. I have some concerns because, you know, we may publish the call or maybe we just hold on publishing it to like after we're fully fixed. But uh, there are errors that you can see in the logs on the replicated security test net right now. I haven't touched a thing in four or five days. And one of them is like invalid proposal signature. And okay, so Zaki had a, a really good theory on why that might occur. Uh, he said that like, maybe that was happening because uh, Node couldn't get the whole block tried to check the signature and then boom, it's invalid, right? But that doesn't explain why it would happen like way after. Um, doesn't really explain it at all, actually. Um, so if we were to like, and by the way, right after this call, I can like uh, shoot a Google doc over in the P2P storms channel, okay? And I can run through the different governance adjustable options. Um, another thing, which again, like, I don't know if this call is live. Is this call live streamed, or is it just recorded? It's just recorded. It's, re it's recorded. Uh, okay. But also, I mean, we have. I mean, I guess it's not that many people in here anymore. But, but yeah. yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, you know, it's just it's problems. just basically yeah. It's just like anybody who was here. I looked at the beginning is is totally fine to know this stuff. Um, I think that Banana King is a really primary problem. Um, Banana King refers to uh, the ability to make IBC transactions that are enormous. Uh, and it's, it's actually named after the, the memo that Felix uh, put in it originally. And... Um, now, I know that IBC is triaging this, but like one of the settings we may want to try. So in the mitigation, I don't know if you saw the mitigation document, but basically in there, I put like, look out for Banana King transactions and consider a mempool filter. And we don't really want validators making those on their own, I think, anyway, because like, you know, you get into questions about MEV and stuff like that. In general, I'm just, I'm not a fan of MEV. Um, if if we could, you know, I'd love to see it eliminated. I think Skip's doing great work in that direction, which is amusing because they came from the MEV camp. But um, uh, like, I guess, yeah, Banana King is pretty serious, guys. There are twelve ish uh, IBC transaction types that can be Banana King. Now yeah, I'll, I'll uh, and and then also, Marco raised a really good point about Banana King that I think that really should be heated, uh, which is that we don't actually know which other modules other than IBC, right? Because basically IBC was operating under the assumption that the SDK was like filtering this stuff, uh, but it's not. And, um, you know, what, one of the things that this resulted in, and, and by the way, there was this question today from, I think it was Marco, about uh, Max TX 
think it was, yeah, it was max TX bytes. Look, on osmosis, there's a 10 meg IBC transaction. I, I don't know why. I don't know how. The other thing is that sucker made it to the hub too. And uh, Cosmos Station proposed the block that that 10 meg IBC transaction is in. Um, oh, thank you, Robin. Yeah, awesome. Um, and then here's here's a uh, a um a link to what it, wait what wasn't that also part of last Thursday? Uh, you were you were you were doing that on the test net, right? Working Thursdays, large yeah, transactions. So the, the, yeah, the only way that I've kicked off. I, yeah, there was no war game Thursday last Thursday. I, I I was just testing everything. I tested four test nets and including like TFL's test net, including Injective's test net, including oh, what was the other one? Uh, Celestia's test net. And unfortunately, like hundred percent, everybody's exposed to this issue. And uh, to to give a quick example a few seconds after beginning a transaction stream that includes uh these banana king transactions and they're fast okay like because the goal here is to cause maximum pain because that's what you know north korean hacker slaves are going to do um so it's you, you know you're trying to fire as many multi-meg IBC transactions as possible uh, into the chain and then also into all the mempools of all the nodes surrounding your node. And then you want to see those get propagated. This is actually where the 10 gig line comes in. But hey, another thing, uh, in the injective case, right, their testnet is in a cube cluster. And it's this is kind of scary. I could make their validators miss blocks and I only had a public RPC. That was my only access to it and it was slow. And there were only three validators. And then on, that, that on, the, on mm -hmm. the hub test that we saw we saw a slowdown in block production, right? Oh uh, well, yeah, but it's massive. So like uh okay let me give you some examples of the slowdowns. Okay. So uh a, a slowdown of from six seconds to 45 seconds. That happens instantly if you have 21 meg blocks. Now, here's the thing, Pub has 200K blocks, okay? And well, let me tell you what's up with that. That, in that case, uh, that had one 38 minute block and then a 30 minute period with just four blocks. Uh, there was another case, which I don't really think was related to block side, Mm -hmm. Was that last? Was that last Thursday with the new the new settings? Uh, yeah. Okay. So, good question. Dante's settings <laughs> with Dante's uh, Max TX settings. Yeah, you start the transaction stream. You immediately get a net split. Uh, if all of the validators are not on the exact same settings. Now, a neat thing, like. You know, I definitely, I, I'm a fan of Dante's ideas on mitigations and several of them made it into the set of recommendations in the Placid repository. Um, but like some of them really needed to be global or the network got really screwed up. Now, the cool thing is the chain stayed live, but I make mean, clear, like, I don't consider a 38 minute block live. I consider that like a giant fraud or FUD window during which time uh, an attacker can do. Look, if, if you're using like leveraged shorts, okay, you don't need to make the price go down a lot to make a lot of money. And uh, so we got to consider that in the threat model. Um, and. Uh, so there was a 38 minute block. There was a 30 minute period with just four blocks. I think that's the same story. And then uh, there was another time where I got Haifa's nodes 
to all have OOM errors. Okay, they all got reaped by that OOM. Was, was that last Thursday with the new settings though? Yeah, yeah, Jacob. Uh, let's, I want to establish the, what the same I, settings are. Yeah, let's let's be a little bit more specific about the order of events. There was a time when the um, the mempool settings that that uh, Dante put in place was only applied to a few nodes, Apple, Cherry, and Banana. And that's the time when you were seeing the net splits, which makes sense. After that, on Thursday, we did a global announcement where we got um, about 23, 23 of the validators, which is most of the validators, to change to the recommended settings that, that, uh, that we, we were using for the mempools. So this is with um, max TX bytes to 200,000 and max TX's bytes to uh, uh, 1 million something, uh, I believe. And after that, I don't believe we saw any net splits. We did see slower blocks, but um, from the monitoring scripts that I have, I think that the average block time um, uh, decreased to seven point two on average seven point two seconds. Not, not there. There weren't thirty eight minute blocks. Um, I don't even know if I was attacking. Like on Thursday, uh, last Thursday. Well, if yeah, I we, was, we okay. we spoke on on Thursday, and and both ourselves, Haifa and Clemens, had the monitoring script up. Okay, good, good, good. Okay. Um, please understand I've been working like lots. Uh, of course, of course, yeah. Uh, and okay, so that that's that's good news. I'm going to give you the bad news. I those whitelisted transactions, guys, they're free. Uh, I think they slide right in. And you're talking about the, this is you're talking about the global fee uh, module whitelisted transactions. Yeah, right? yeah. this is for yeah. the, for the real heirs. Yeah, this is a known yeah. problem, of course. You know, I, I know <laughs> indeed. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. Well, <laughs> you know, I reported it, um, and uh, um, but yeah, but, I, I'm not. I'm not a fan. <laughs> Personally, I'm not a fan of the the whitelist. Uh, uh, I okay. So I, so I think I'm a fan, but like I think that we should whitelist based on governance is my feels. Um, of course, this like enshrines sort of like vendors and could be bad. There's also centralization risk. So you're uh, saying, in, but not enshrine transact messages or message types. Enshrine specific vendors. That's what you're saying. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Like specific relayers, um, and uh, you know, just 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 people who aren't going to clog up the chain. One of the reasons for this is that ICS is very IBC intensive, and um, I also see a ton of client updates on the hub. That's like one of the biggest routine transactions, and I do think that like we just cut the whitelist, which we may need to do for a bit on mainnet, by the way, um, you know, relay costs are going to go up a bunch. Uh, and, um, but there's, there's kind of more, I guess I'll just go into detail on this for everybody. Um, so yeah, we, we are, at, we're at, we're at time here. Um, do you think that we could talk tomorrow? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's totally fine by me. And, and set up um, some and set up some some yeah. tests on the on the actual test net. Yeah, well, that's cool with me. I'll I'll set up like a suggestions document. Get that into P two P storms. Just in terms of like what scenarios uh, we should test and and Udit, like you know, please uh, interject yes. right and, and get your thoughts in there too. Um, yeah, why don't you start that document? Maybe we can put together a runbook so we have an order of operations where we can say, well, this governance proposal followed by these tests, and then after that we transition to a next governance proposal followed by you know a next set of tests, just so that we can do this somewhat systematically. One of the things I'm concerned about is that if we don't do it systematically, we will not be able to put, you know, make a a strong justification for the changes publicly. Yes. So well, we let, we, we just... definitely should do it. Systematically, 
definitely. Um, a oh, some of some of the scenarios uh, require some additional development, and people should just look in the spammy repository uh, if they have access. Uh, Mr. Crow's Nest, I know you're on the call. Like, basically, we're we're only doing it under mutual NDA. Uh, I did offer that to any validator, and I, I, it's like really hard to figure out the the the, the way to do this. Uh, but that's the way we've chosen. Um, and like, there are some additional scenarios that I have seen stop networks uh, that are just not fully developed yet. And I will start the document right after this call. I know we're over time, so I'll just thank everybody and put the Google Doc in P2P storms. Yeah, okay. thanks thank everyone. You, um, yeah, yeah, let's try to stop the test net and then uh, start it again. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the idea. Cool, all right, bye-bye. Oh. Yeah. Bye. Bye.